I really like this example because it's made with Arduino. So uh, clap for Daito. Thank you, Daito. So uh, I, uh, Daito Manabe is a Japanese artist, and uh, he's actually pretty famous. And uh, this is what happens. It's like Arduino is more or less everywhere. And I'm here today to tell you a story of the journey that I'm living in my life, which is basically try to live up to the expectations to carry this project to the next level. So. Arduino, many people think, is about electronics, but I'm going to try to prove you today that it's not about electronics, it's about so much more. So uh, let me just fight my mouse. Arduino is about making stuff. So today I'm going to be talking about making stuff. Like you wake up in the morning and you want to make something and you realize that you might need the tools. And this was what's happening to me a lot of times. I was waking up in the morning and I was thinking, how can I mount this thing? How, how can I build this thing? And uh, what's happening to me, I was happening to my students here at K3. So let me just uh, slide over this. So this whole work started because I, I got recruited in 2001 to be teaching in interaction design. And I came to Sweden straight from Infineon. And I used to be designing microchips. And suddenly I was going to be teaching design students how to program Java. So it's like two completely different universes. So I jumped from being in this corridor packed with PhDs uh, really geniuses in how to pack a lot of transistors in a very small amount of space. To be in a room with people that didn't know math, but they really wanted to make something beautiful. So it's like two completely different worlds. So I had to deal with interaction design. And interaction design to me, after 12 years working in the field, is about linking services, objects, and people. And uh, so I have to be taking care of all those things. And this is what I do through Arduino. So the, the statement I want to make is I'm not just doing electronics, and I hope that by the time you leave this room, you will understand that. I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so explaining this, and I will let you 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. So the Arduino team is, uh, is actually true. It's not like, I mean, when you want to start something, sometimes your own knowledge is not enough to reach but sometimes your own contacts are not enough to reach to people. In this case, we happen to be at the same place, at the same time, having a similar need. And we just happen to you know, talk to each other for a very short time. And I tell you, two days were enough to make this thing. And this is what happened seven years ago. So this guy here, the guy with the glasses up here, Dave Mellis, uh, was a student to this guy here, Massimo Bansi. And I came to visit to work with this guy in making some electronics that have nothing to do with Arduino. And this was the engineer that was manufacturing the electronics for this guy. So he was incidentally going to manufacture my electronics. And this guy here, Tom, oh, this is Gianluca, I forgot to mention his name. And Tom is a professor at New York that was coming for the summer to help out at the same school where he was working that I was visiting where this guy was a student. So we, we had a lot in common. We, we all like pizza. So we just uh, sat together and said, what if we made a system that was working like this and was doing this? And, you know, two days later we had a system, we were manufacturing it, and we were going to use it at the School of Design in Ibrea, in Italy, at, at K3. Because we basically wanted to have a tool for our students to build stuff. We wanted them to be able of expressing concepts with physical objects. That was very important for us. We, we, we made a plan 
looking ahead and saying like, life is not only going to be software. You know, once we have devices that are powerful enough, uh, we will be able of, or, I'm cheap enough, sorry, we will be able of like manufacturing hardware that will be doing very specific things, like a frying pan with a temperature sensor. This might sound like alien to you, but this is perfectly doable, right? It doesn't even need a battery because it would use induction to power up that chip inside the frying pan. You know, you, you can imagine all sorts of crazy things. And by that time, our industrial designers should be ready to create concepts using that technology. That was our thing. And we wanted our schools, the school in, in Italy and the school in Malmo, to be ahead in this way of thinking. And we just needed tools. And Arduino was just one more tool to be able to think in that way. So this is the context. Interaction design, industrial design, interactive art, 2005. We only had screws, hammers, and our brains. For us at that time, digital technology was starting up a discussion about the, uh, about the interactivity. I mean, we had been talking about the web a lot, but we were jumping into the physical world. There was a book out that was called Physical Computing, actually by Tom Igo, that was inviting people to take microcontrollers and take sensors and put them together and try to bring them into computers. But the tools were far too expensive. Interaction design for us was the creation of meaningful relationships between us humans and the artifacts. So we had to figure out which kind of symbols, which kind of uh, items convey a meaning by themselves. You know, the circle with the stick doesn't mean anything, or it didn't mean anything 15 years ago. Nowadays, in every single culture, this means on-off. Or, am I wrong? Doesn't it mean on-off for you? I mean, if there is anybody here who doesn't understand this thing as on-off, you could stand up and leave. So <clears throat> then interactivity is also about the creation of beautiful relationships between humans and artifacts. We definitely like an uh, interaction that is aesthetically pleasant. You know, it's like, why did you like the Nokia 5110? Because it was 10 times better than the equivalent from Sony Ericsson, right? I mean, it was black and white. It had like small buttons, but the, the interaction with that phone was like, you know, a thousand times better than with the equivalent from Alcatel or whatever other company. And that's why the iPhone was such a big success, even though the technology inside was so much worse. It's because the UI was better, and that's no doubt about it, okay? But it wasn't even 3G, you know, the first iPhone, which is a shame. So <clears throat> I always use this icon. It's like when you make your website, there is like a thousand clipboards to represent the same thing, and you have to be clever enough to find the right one the one that not only expresses what you want to express, but the one that fits with the rest. And that's very important. And then there is a relationship of tension between us and the machines. You know, new devices introduce new challenges. Right now, for example, I guess that all of you are against um, carrying an RFID chip embedded in your hand, right? But you're perfectly okay with your dogs having it on their ear. So it's just about a matter of time that we will all carry an RFID chip embedded somewhere in our bodies, or multiple RFID chips somewhere in our bodies. Right now, it provokes this conflict. It will bring up a discussion, we will fight a little bit about it, we will see the advantages, we will forget about the disadvantages, and we'll just get them on. It's how it is. It's like right now you're having something that helps you be identifiable and find you everywhere you are at, which is your phone. It's just a matter of time until you embed it in your body. Just embrace it, right? So technology and the human being meet through interaction design, or we use interaction design to make us meet, and we have these three important aspects. The, how pretty it is, how well it conveys a meaning, and whether or not it provokes some kind of tension. The tension is where the business opportunities are. Just think about it. If you work in like a five years time vision, you are going to be working with something that right now is really kinky, but in five years it's going to be super hot. That's what I like to be. So, yeah, I like to show this picture of phones. It's like, you know, phones right now, they made it to a point where you can give a phone to a kid. I mean, 15 years ago, you wouldn't give this guy gigantic Motorola phone to anybody, mostly because uh, if a kid was carrying this thing, it would probably hurt himself. You know, if it was like falling or something. It's not so much about the phone breaking, it was that expensive. But, but nowadays, with this thing, technology can do so many more things. Among other things, it can help you find your kids somewhere. 
by a small app that just pushes GPS information to a website, right? So <clears throat> the question in 2005 was, how can we bring this digital world to interact with the physical one? Which are the available tools? And the answer was basic stamp from Parallax. You know, There was like this very concrete device that everybody in the world were using. It was that expensive, and it didn't really offer us many options. It wasn't even USB. So we couldn't prototype things because it didn't talk to our computers. So we had to come up with something else. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, how? Well, I'm going to tell you how we did it at K3. At K3, I was used to do things like this. You know, try to make experiments with technology and fashion, for example. This experiment was uh, called, um, was it Dress for Success? No, that's, that's the song from this band. Um, I can't remember. Anyway, this was a class that we did to try to experiment with the idea of making wearable computing devices. At the time, there was like, by far, nothing we could use. But the students worked in building new concepts. So Bjorn here, he made a, a second head for himself. And the second head was your head. This camera was pointing to your face, and you would see your face up here. So suddenly you had this like mutant being looking at you, or you were looking at yourself, kind of, while talking to Bjorn. Yeah. And uh, she made uh, telephone doggies, you know, a daycare for phones. So she would go to public spaces where she's not really allowed to talk on the phone. And in this, uh, in this outfit here, she has like multiple pockets. And she will get you a number and get your phone in the pocket and will answer the phone for you. So it was a temporary secretary. And uh, it was all about entering in this space where there is a conflict about using your phone and, you know, compromise with taking care of it so that you could always answer your calls and so on. Because back in 2003, you know, people were not really using the answering machine. It was kind of important to answer the mobile phone as it was happening. You know, that, that specific use of the phone has kind of disappeared. How many of you talk on the phone nowadays? Just think about it. How long do you speak on the phone? When you get the bill, by the end of the day, you're basically paying data. You're not paying voice. Most of you might be getting the voice calls for free because you didn't use them, right? But back in 2003, it was super important. You had to answer the call. So you had to telephone, Dagis. It will take care of your communication. So at K3, we did things like this. This was what I like to call the Arduino Leonardo. I don't know if you know Arduino Leonardo. It's our, one, of, one of our latest boards, and, uh, because it has two serial ports. And this one had like two serial ports. And this was handmade by the students. I mean, the, the platforms were really expensive. So we had to handmade the things here in class. So the design students, after learning Java, they would learn how to make circuit boards. That was the way to go. And the degree of failure was pretty high. Um, it also means that as a teacher, I had to spend an enormous amount of hours fixing the things that were broken for them. Because for the good learning experience, even though they made failures, they was had, to, had to work the day after. They couldn't fail. So they would make the boards, leave them on my desk. I would like troubleshoot them. Sometimes I had to rewire them completely and have them work in the morning after. But then they made amazing things, like the automatic confession booth. This was present at the Gothenburg Science Fair in 2004. And you would go into this room, and it would give you confession, Catholic confession. Sorry for Catholics, but anyway, I'm one. So I'm allowed to say this. So you would go into this booth, close the door, and it would tell you, would you kneel down, please? You would kneel down. Tell you, would you like to confess your sins? And you would start talking. And you would hear this whispering like, <coughs> yeah. And after a couple of minutes, we'll just make a rewinding sound, just proving you that you've been fooled, and tell you, you are welcome to leave. And then you will stand up and come out and think, like, where is that person hidden in here? Because it's a very small cabin. You know, it's like, there is no way you can put a second person in there. And for real, this was just a state machine that was like checking that you lock the door, that you put the lock in the door, that you kneel down, and they had a pressure sensor to make sure that you were close enough to confess your sins and so on. And it was just like playing random sounds of like, say, somebody listening, like when you talk to a friend and his brain is somewhere else in space, but it's like, yeah, it's physically present. Right? So the same thing. And you know, this thing became very famous because there was a, a Catholic person coming into the science fair, into the booth, and there was the SVT film in this thing. So this guy went inside, and when he came out, they asked him, how did he feel? He said, it was like real life. So this thing became very, very famous. 
<clears throat> between that and this that we did last year, that is basically making prototypes with mobile phones and electronics, you know, it's like a seven years difference. It's like seven years of development and trying things out and building things and making it easy for people. So Arduino is about that. It's about you want to convey something, you want to help people building meaning around the physical object, and you need to give them a tool for them to make that possible. So that's what we do. <clears throat> so Arduino is specialized in making platforms. Platforms are made of hardware, are made of software, and are made of documentation. Because I, if I give you a hammer and I don't tell you how to hammer, most likely the first four times you will kick yourself in the knee and it will be pretty painful. So basically in Arduino, we give you the manual to the hammer. And we tell you, you know, you use it on nails. And you put the nails on wood. And you put the wood together. And we even give you the manual on how to make a chair. So not just the hammer and the nails, but the manual to the chair. So you, by the end of your first session, you will be sitting on a chair that you build yourself. And that empowers you because it's your chair. I mean, it's not your chair. I gave you the whole thing, you know. I, I gave you the map, and I gave you the wood, and I gave you the nails, and I gave you the hammer, but you built it. I mean, it will be a bit shaky because you built it, most likely. But And all the blueprints and everything are open source, so you, so you can actually reuse them. You can hack them and rebuild on them, and you can give them to a friend, and you can make a business on them and sell the chairs if you want to, and you don't even have to mention me. And that's pretty cool. So Arduino is made of a, this platform that is a compendium of these three things. The boards, the software to program the boards, and the documentation. If we make a better board, we need better software, and we need better documentation. And this goes in this cycle the whole time. Because when people get used to this board, and they, sing like in, they, can, they see they can turn on and off a light, and they can read the sensor, and they can move a motor, they say, OK, how can I play video? It's like, guy, for 25 euros with this thing, you can't really play video. It's like, you need more horsepower. But people are like, yeah, OK, OK, I want the same kind of feeling. Because you know, if I can say digital right, turn the light on, I could say, turn video on. And I can make my video installation. And when somebody claps in the room, the video goes on. It's fantastic. It's like, yeah, sure. You hire engineers for that. That's what we usually say. No. It's not like that. We got that request so much that we are now launching new platforms that can actually do more stuff. Because technology allows. And when you empower people to do things, the next thing they come is where they want more. And you have to give them more. Mostly because it's about education. And when you create this cycle, what you get is a lot of interested people around this community of practice, of people that want to do things and want to build things and want to learn more about making things. And at some point, they even imagine they can make a business out of these things. So, <clears throat> yeah, this is a fact. This is our world map of Arduino. Green represents uh, North America, yellow represents Europe, uh, orange represents uh, Asia. The thing is that since we don't understand Chinese, none of us, we really have like no idea of the real expansion in Asia. But truth is that we know that, for example, a publisher called Gaken made a magazine about Arduino, and they sold 300,000 copies of this magazine, and that magazine included an Arduino board inside. You know, So we do believe that we are really present in Asia, but we have no way of knowing at this point how present we are. So if you know some Chinese and Japanese people that want to help out mapping this thing, please let me know by the end of this talk. <clears throat> because so far we know that we have pushed out in the world 870,000 boards. But when we look at the statistics in our server, there are many more than 870,000 different users coming to the website. Because we know for a fact that there's probably two or three times as many boards in the world because people copy them. Or they make derivative boards, which means boards that work with the same software but have ad ad advanced features on them, like can do other things that our boards don't do yet. So what we see is that this ecosystem generates this like snowball effect, and more people get added to it and keeps on growing and growing and growing. So what is our contribution? Well, we are challenging the current education methods. You know, we provide the tools, but we don't provide the books. I mean, usually education is based on 
you go somewhere you want to learn about. Like the other day, I decided I want to learn again about neural networks. I learned back at the university, but I'm really interested in this new emerging field interaction design that is a neural network-based pattern analysis. That is really boring, by the way. But I, I decided, okay, I want to learn about this again. So I went online and bought myself a 65 euros book. It's going to be my Christmas present to myself. You know, I cannot afford any more than that. So with Arduino, we thought, like, look, it's like the tools are pretty expensive. Let's try to make it as cheap as possible. But if people on top of the tools, they need to buy the books, they will never get the tools. So we need to give them the documentation for free and allow them to hack that documentation and reuse it and improve it. I mean, we were in the beginning just five people. So we said, like, you know what? Everything is Creative Commons and GPL. So take it, improve it. And if you want to pay us back by putting things on our website, you have this website open here, just put, punching things. You know what? The biggest repository in Arduino documentation is the Arduino website, made by 120,000 registered users. That's it. You know, And we have changed the way companies that produce silicon create documentation about their products. They don't make it with the company members. They made it with a community of users. For example, Texas Instruments, they've made a board called the Launchpad 430 that costs four euros 30 or four dollars 30, sorry, where they didn't do a documentation for this board. They said, hey guys, we put the board here, we make it very cheap and you document it. You know, it didn't really work that well because they were not us, sorry. So then we also work very much in bringing uh, fun aspects of applied science. You know, by, by concentrating, we, we, we frame the knowledge. It's like, we know if you work at a high school, as a teacher, you have 45 minutes to bring the students from this to this. And by the way they want to go home, you want them to go home feeling that they learned something. So you need to provide them with that path. Like, it's almost like you teach somebody how to play theater. You know, you teach them how to become Macbeth and talk to the thing here. Just this, this thing is an Arduino board. Hello, Arduino board. Can you show me the way to physics? And then it shows you acceleration, for example. Then a very important concept for us, concept for us is peer-to-peer -peer education. It's mouth-to-mouth -mouth dissemination. It's like we use the hacker method, mostly because we are hackers, all of us. So I teach Tim, since you came, I have to use you, I'm sorry. And uh, Tim will teach his dad. I know this is how it works in this case. <laughs> So, um, and then he will teach somebody else. But at every iteration, since I will not stop by teaching Tim, I will start teaching Jon, then, then we will go at the power of two, adding more and more people to the equation, and it will be growing and growing. Then, this is a very important aspect. We don't own the platform. We let people own, oh, sorry. We let people own the platform. By making it the way we make it, we let you, you, let you take ownership of it, own parts of it, document your part, take your share, and share it with others. We also changed the way a laboratory looks like. You know, I, I worked at those laboratories where you go with the white pajamas, where you have to like get into this like air pressure environment so that the dust comes down and it will never go into the waffles where you make the microchips. And uh, to me, a laboratory had to do work with like coffee and coffee being spoiled on the computer and people soldering and, you know. This is our first laboratory at K3, which is in the cafeteria, because at the School of Arts, we had like no laboratory, you know. So, so I, I jumped from the white pajamas in just three years this direction. And you might think it's downgrading, but it's the other way. It's super upgrading. It's like you feel like technology has made it this far. You can use it anywhere and you can create it anywhere almost anywhere. You, of course, don't make the chips at the cafeteria of the university, but... And it also changed, we should change the way people communicate. So this, I like to put this example at all times. It's like my students were building this uh, device and they needed to ask a question and they didn't really know much about schematics because after five weeks you cannot really teach people about schematics. It's not that easy. Schematics is a very complicated engineering language to express circuit boards. But, you know, you cannot really see it in this picture because it's really bright, but maybe you can see here there's a small scissor. Can you see the small scissor on this side? Well, this means that you can cut this thing here and on this other side, and you can apply power, and these LEDs will shine beautifully. 
And this, this comes in a 50 meters long stripe of LEDs. And you can cut them at different places. As a matter of fact, you could cut this thing anywhere in between the LEDs. But my students didn't know, so they were asking me, can we cut it on this side or on this side of the component? You know, it didn't matter, but I didn't expect them to know the answer either. So they sent me this email to ask. Please uh, forget about the F word. And this is what they did. This is what they did. And it's an interactive rocking chair. And as you rock the chair, the light simulates water, and it goes back and forth. This was exhibited, exhibited at um, Ars Electronica 2006, in September that year. Okay. <clears throat> there are some new paradigms that we are work, working with. Okay, visual programming is not such a new paradigm. But from a physical computer, as I explained earlier, it's not such a new paradigm. It's already like almost 10 years old. But we're starting to talk about interlace programming, which means what happens when you are, I mean, when you build electronics, the first thing you do most of the time is that you build the hardware or you make a humongous analysis of what do I need? I want to make all this computing power because I'm going to make like encryption low level and so on and so forth. And then, so you, you build this platform and then you start putting software in it. And then you realize, okay, we made this mistake and you make a second iteration of the platform and make software. But, you know, it would be so much better if you could just like, you apply a bit of hardware, you try it out, and you do some software, and then you check the documentation and so on. A more interlaced process for learning. So that's what we're working with. So that you are not anymore, you know, having to go through this, okay, I make the hardware, have to abstract and believe in a lot of stuff, and then I can write the code. You that, the ones of you that attended the course that we did now, that was a bit of an experience of interlaced learning. You know, you put something and then you write something for that one specific light. You see that it works and then you add the push button and then you write something for the push button and then you grow and you grow and you spin the, the thing and it gets that this big. And after two hours, you look back and you realize, I, I climb up this mountain, right? And you don't even know how you made it that far. That's part of the experience. And I will not talk about tangible coding because that's my secret project that I carry with me. I'm sorry. So. I think we've changed the idea of prototyping a little bit. Because we brought prototyping from being something that you do in the industry to be something that you do in the classroom. To let people build something that's like a one-run thing to measure the temperature or to measure acceleration and then use it, right? So to me, it's very important. To me, prototyping is getting to express concepts by compromising some of the functionality, but keeping the aesthetics of interaction intact. So you have this mock carton and the user will come in here and believe it's the real thing, you know? And you have to like smash his face, like, no, come on, it's not real. It's just a toy. You cannot buy this thing. Well, you can also fool people and let them buy it and then run away. But it's about building it quick, letting people experience it, see how it feels, and going back to the drawing board and do it again. <clears throat> this is an example of a egg timer. I, as a basic experiment, I ask people, to make me a soft boiled egg. And I ask, like after two days working in class, I tell them, okay, make me a soft boiled egg timer. And uh, Bjorn, who besides being uh, pretty quick, he, he invented something, a, a building system made in cardboard that he called nine centimeters is enough. And I know that sounds really bad, but it's because there is nine centimeters between these two pieces of cardboard here. And inside this board, inside this box, he will put the Arduino board and the battery, and then he will build everything on top of it. And it was this modular cardboard system. And by the time he did this, we had no laser cutters. He was cutting everything by hand. So with his modular system applied to laser cutters right now, he could build things in cardboard in no time. So his egg timer is one of the best ones I've ever seen, made in 2006. When we put it down, the LEDs, the first LED that is lit, goes off and goes in here and so on. So it's like a, you know, like a hourglass, but made of LEDs. And by the end of the thing, it beeps. And it remains there because it's it made it to the end. If you want another boiled egg, you turn it back again and so on. Very simple interaction conveys the meaning and it totally shows that you can boil a soft boiled egg in cardboard. <clears throat> another thing that happened with Arduino is that we came to realize we were the first successful open source hardware business. 
we never intended to be a business, okay? I want to make this very clear. We wanted to be a foundation, but we realized that being a five people operation, it was really hard to be a foundation. We would spend the little money we were making into paying a secretary and a president instead of, you know, trying to pay our flying tickets to meet up and build more things. So at some point people started to ask, okay, how would it be to make this idea of like giving away this design of the hardware available for everybody else? So a bunch of people got together and created the open source hardware definition. And a bit later on, uh, the CERN Institute in Switzerland helped creating the open source hardware license that is available now. So if you want to make anything hardware, you can make it as free as you can make software. Okay, just keep it in mind. So uh, I have a lot of other things, but I want to open the floor for questions. And actually, David, so. I think that we're gonna take the questions over there and get yeah. Ralph ready. Okay. Uh, because we're running a little late and we do have uh, a talk from IBM in Vermont. Vermont, we cannot move. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you take the questions over there and we install Rolf. Yeah, sure. Over there, out. Mm. Uh, over by Tiffany. Okay. I think, have how, you two how, met? How do we take the questions by Tiffany? Just uh, go I here. sit yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> or you sit with Tiffany, not to move you. But just here, because then we can uh, install Rolf. Okay. I want to be in front of the speaker. I will because you can beeping. handle every question yourself. You're so used to it. Yes. You don't need me at all. Mm. Any questions? It's now or never, guys. I'm going to run away. <laughs> Should probably turn my computer off, right? So, if you understand this one. The microphone is not on. Okay, now it's on. Yeah. Whoa. Hello. Hello. I didn't know. Are you okay? Oh, we should yeah, I'm a teacher at high school, I, and I, um, I'm a leader in, a, in my department when it comes to technology. And I wonder, what kind of students would you like uh, at the university? What, what do you want to... I, I'm about to introduce Arduino and laser cutters and all this stuff. We're doing it as, as we speak. What... What would you like your students that comes into the university to know or to, you know, what's the most important aspect? I want them to be happy. I mean, no, seriously. I mean, when I studied, when I made it to university, I had to take extra math courses and extra physics courses and extra drawing courses because university was so hard. Is it, I mean, the university was not at the level at which the high school students were prepared. So I had to take extra courses outside school to get ready. And I was going to one of the best schools in town. Um, I think that's the wrong mindset. I think university needs to get adjusted to the level that society works. I think that as university, I think that we have to help you so that you, you and us can understand how the kids are ready, how ready they are, so we can help them. But to me, it's more important at this point that the kids know how to read and write. Uh, because that's something we're facing. I mean, okay, I might not speak Swedish, but I understand when a student is really bad in writing Swedish. And I see this every day. So to me, it's more important that they are well prepared on that regard, that, that they know about how to make a program. Yeah. You know? And again, if they know how to read and write and they know how to program, it's twice as good. Uh, you know? That's uh, my concern. So that almost sounds like you don't suggest us to use Arduino at high school. Like I mean, I'm not selling you Arduino. I'm talking, we're talking now about high school oh. education. So, uh, I mean, I, I, my heart is divided because I'm a, I'm a university teacher here and I deal with this all the time. You know, we, we see kids coming and uh, we're seeing their skills many times. And we don't blame either the teachers or the students, but we see that the system is really having some flaws. And I think we all need to work together. And, you know, I'm really happy that you and the Swedish system and the Italian system and the Spanish system and the... I've been working with high schools since 2006 in Argentina, Spain, you know, all over the place. 
helping people to bring these things in, but this is just about helping people to understand that digital technology makes part of our everyday life. But I think we shouldn't forget about other skills that are also important. And when you say what I think the kids should know, if I said if they know how to program, that's beautiful. You know, whatever language, I don't care. If they use Arduino, fine, if they use something else, whatever. But you know, programming is so some, some basic in our lives nowadays. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I have another question yeah. before I leave the mic <laughs> and sing something. Um, how do we get women more interested in design, in technology, in studying, in choosing technology programs at high school level, at university level? How do we get them? We need more. <laughs> Definitely not making things pink. I would just say this because it's a common mistake among all of us. But uh, I mean, the gender, the gender discussion is a very important discussion when it comes to this. And I, and I think first we need to face one thing, and it's like society is built in a certain way, and we teachers are just one part of those kids' everyday interactions. And then they have their homes and they have their friends. And for example, I never taught my kid about the color pink. I never told my kid about Barbie. She has five Barbies. She loves pink, and uh, so this basically means that you know they they get this from everybody else, and it also means that this concept that or this issue that uh, tech is made for men. Well, I'm not so sure of that, I'm, but, but I'm really sure of one thing: it's like girls are not introduced to tech the same way, and you're right on that. And how we can make it better. Well, from our side, we try to approach the issue from many points of view. For example, since 2007, I had this one slide that said, I hate robots. Because robotics is understood as a very good way of introducing technology to kids. But what I see in the robotics classes is that 90% of the kids are boys. And I, I try to do other things that were interesting. You know, try to build other systems, try to make a different type of software uh, that's more appealing to different interests. I'm not even saying genders, I'm saying different interests, and that's very important. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean for example, uh, we make, I make music instruments, we make wearable devices. Um, uh, there's, been an, there's been a European experiment, for example, called Eduware, trying to analyze how to make wearable devices and teach the kids how they can make their own handbags and add sensors to the handbags. and. And uh, that was very successful with both boys and girls, for example. So I think there is other things that can be done that are more appealing to a bigger spectrum of kids. You know, and, and see that I'm very careful. I try not to talk about boys and girls. You know, I, I really try. I, um, it's really hard. You know. Okay, guys, we <laughs> can't have any more questions. You have to yeah. hunt David down, and he's Thank a you. fast runner. Let's give him a big hand.